Hey everyone, I am Rafi Salem. Welcome back to the Manhattan Edit Workshop monthly-ish digital fireside chat with Josh Apter, Jason Backey, and today, the one and only Jamie Hitchings. How are you today, Jamie? Pretty good. Thanks for asking. How are you? I uh, Well, I'm okay. I'm in New York. I mean, Josh, Jason, and I are in New York, and you're in California. So, you know, I'd like to say that our fall foliage weather is nice but how's it out in california is it it is sunny and i think about 72 not a cloud in the sky right now uh, that's called perfect perfect you know, seeing that from the bridge of the enterprise i, I don't understand are you not you do realize that we have sensors in the enterprise right like we can we can help these things yes yes so uh one so why don't we have a round of introductions? Josh, Jason, why don't you introduce yourselves and then you guys can introduce Jamie. Okay. Well, I'm Josh Apter, uh, founder of Manhattan Edit Workshop. Um, we've been doing this for, I don't know, 20? Is it? We celebrated our 20-year anniversary this year. So we've been around a long time, um, you know, uh, helping people, teaching people, getting them out there and working and realizing their dreams of, you know, becoming career editors and, and better graphic designers and filmmakers for a long time. Um, so, and Jamie was a part of that at the very beginning. So exciting to sit down with her. We'll talk more about that. That's, that's my intro so far. Yeah. I don't have much to add to that, except I'm Jason Banky. I'm the president of Manhattan Workshop and, uh, basically help Josh run the joint, uh, keep it afloat. And, um, Jamie actually taught me so that's how I got introduced to Manhattan at a workshop. So there's a probably a story of not to tell there. <laughs> that's that's pretty much what I have. Rocky, yeah. you want to... <laughs> I, I, I'm, I was going to say, Jamie, how about you? I mean, uh, it, it's a little weird that you as a teenager were teaching Jason as an adult. I mean, that doesn't make any sense whatsoever but i had to work for the family you know we just had to at the tough times um i'm a new york native originally i uh, and i worked at manhattan at workshop from 2000 early 2004 until i left new york in 2010 so i worked at me shop for a very very long time and um, currently, I am a professor at Orange Coast College, and I'm a documentary filmmaker. Um, I guess that, that's I've been doing that for a while, so it's not currently, but that's what I do most of the time to occupy my time. So let's uh, let's jump into that. My uh, so my son is in film school, and that's one of the way that one of the ways that uh, I have a little insight into the industry. But you know, it's so interesting because we started these chats talking about all right what movies are going on now what's on netflix what's streaming what's in the theaters etc cetera, etc cetera. it takes a i would say a special person in a positive way to focus on documentary so josh why don't you cue this up uh josh and, Jason, and um let's talk a little bit about the industry and why someone goes into documentaries as opposed to you know big blockbusters well, I think anyone who goes into any filmmaking endeavor is insane. Um, I consider it to be one of the best illnesses you can have. There's almost almost anything you're going to do is going to be more secure and and I don't say dare I say lucrative than filmmaking. And specifically for documentary, a long time it was really just a you know about passion projects, labors of love. Um, I don't think until. This is a long time ago now. Um, the movie Crumb came out, and Michael Moore, is that right? yeah, started making films that started reaching a broader audience. The documentary started having what we were calling as sort of you know its its heyday or um, day in the sun, but that they, they've become increasingly more popular. They're always you know um, movies that people are excited to see, uh, as been evidenced by the re-release of the Talking Head Stop Making Sense film that was having dance parties during the screenings of people that were probably not even born when the thing came out in the, in the, in the first place. Um, and I think reality TV helped also people, you know, become more of an audience to nonfiction. Um, but from an editing perspective, and this is a long-winded answer, 
you know, when we teach in the six week class and we look at nonfiction, we talk about the editor as as author um, more than they might be in a scripted uh, <clears throat> context. Because in this, you know, if you have a line script, that just the lines mean like this is the master shot of the wide shot. This is the close up of the one character. This is, you have a roadmap. And you know what coverage you have and you cho choose performance and you you can cut and shape those and reorder them, restructure story. But in the documentary, you have often hundreds, if not thousands of hours of footage to essentially find the story in within. And it becomes more of a project where the editor is the writer and creator of that story because they're usually, you know, it's certainly part of the team and and I've seen a lot of editors get co-director credit because of it, but they're really going in there and mining that footage for character, for narrative moments, for really like the story within that giant pile of footage. And, um, you know, it's, it's an amazing thing. And it's, and it's, it's different than narrative film editing. And in a way, I think it's more challenging and more for myself, certainly when I did it more gratifying, but I also think that they're, they, you know, they're not dissimilar art forms, and um, you know, it's uh, it, it's sort of a, an incredible, an incredible discipline um, to learn and become an expert on the subject, whether it's air guitar and air guitar competitions, like in Jamie's film Catching Air, or you know, becoming an expert, like um, you know, we had some a friend who who cut a film about um, what was his name? Um, well, for, he did one about Metallica. When they went into group therapy sessions called Some Kind of Monster, he became an expert and a fan of heavy metal music because it wasn't really something that he was that knowledgeable about. But you, you get like these mini, you know, degrees in each of the subjects that you're studying when you're immersed in in these hours and hours and hours of footage to cut these these stories. Maybe I do need a glass of water. Um, I shouldn't have started with that one. But, you know, that's. That's my appreciation of nonfiction. I know it was a long-winded one, but um, Jason, what 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 thoughts do you have on? Well, I think it's even more popular. I think it goes another step is these docu series, which are like these expansive documentaries now. Are you know they're like massively huge, especially over the pandemic. I I I think that uh, Tiger King or whatever show was just loosely reality, but it wasn't. It was still a docu series or How to Make a Murder. All those you know, exploded this market now. I know Jamie's is not uh, like that, but I feel like you probably had enough footage to do probably if you really wanted to string it out and go, which we could talk about um, more in depth in each of these stories of these people, as opposed to trying to do what you did, which was, you know, well, we'll talk about that. But, um, and I think when we have people come into the workshop now, they're not just looking to do a documentary film. They're looking at these like Netflix docu-series stuff is like these majorly huge projects that are even bigger than these films. And maybe some of them shouldn't be, but they are. Um, but that that's what I think. I think that it's even grown more. It's just bigger. I don't know. What do you think about that, Jamie? The documentaries as a whole. I think that, you know, um, I would have to say for about the the last decade, documentaries have really been in kind of a, kind of a heyday. Like there's just been, and with the, um, digital distribution and you know netflix just seemed to be buying so many docs and so many docs and so many docs because there was an appetite there and um you know now that digital distribution is changing a little bit and they're not necessarily trying to um they're trying to make money instead of just offer more i'm not sure you know if if this trend for documentaries is going to um continue but i do agree that you know docuseries everybody loves a good docuseries you know it doesn't matter what it is um it's definitely something that i feel like people are feeling as though they're more active viewers they're learning something they're engaged in a story you know they're not just being told something they're thinking about something so i think that's um very important for a lot of people or now they're paranoid i think everybody's going to kill them well that's <laughs> but Josh, Josh, you brought up the key word for me, which was passion. So the 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 two documentaries that I have in my head right now uh, was uh, the Last Dance, uh, which was like the first pandemic uh, COVID pandemic documentaries docu series that I had watched, 
I'm not a huge basketball fan, but I'm like, oh, okay, I've got an extra 40 hours in my week now, so I might as well do something with it. And I watched it, and it was cool, but I am not passionate about basketball, but it was great. And then the other last was, of course, The Last Waltz, which was, you know, the documentary about the band, uh, if you guys are music fans, um, which was like one of my first uh, documentaries that I really appreciated. And then I would love to talk about Mock You uh, debt uh, uh, mentories uh, after after we get through the serious stuff. But Jamie, in your documentary, was this a passion of yours? So, so give us a little background uh, and then tell us how you arrived at this moment. Well, um, when I started, started the doc- the doc- that was weird. I had some feedback there. Um, I wanted to do something. I, kn- I knew that I wanted to do something. I was teaching and I work, um, I do contract editing for the United Nations. So I do a lot of, um, or at the time I was doing a lot of editing for the United Nations. Um, and a lot of it was pretty serious stuff that I was I was editing. Rewarding, but, you know, serious. And I decided that I wanted to have a little bit more creative freedom and I wanted to do something and I didn't, I didn't know. I had no idea what I wanted to do. I just had this idea. And um, I'm an avid NPR listener. I love, I love me some NPR. And I was driving home from work one day and I was, um, I heard my co-producer, Eric Maladine, talking about air guitar and NPR. And I'd never, I was like, what in the world is this person talking about? And um, I was fascinated by it. I went at home and I, and I dug a little bit. I, I looked up every name that I could remember because I was driving. And I, and I looked into this and then come to find out my next door neighbor at the time knew Eric from college. So I got this introduction and um, I got to go meet with Eric and he was, he was, he's been involved in media and marketing and things like that for a long time. And he was totally into it. And he was like, I have all this footage. I can get you access. I've been in bands. I can get you some band footage. I can give you all this stuff if you, if you want to do it. And foolishly, I said, yes. And I was like, oh, this is going to be good. I have all this stuff already. And then years later, we finally um, (laughs) get it out to the public. Um, But yes, it was definitely something I was really interested in. I was really interested in the characters. I was really interested in the the people. And I was really interested in how people from outside the community perceive air guitar, because it's not always um, very positive. So, jo- ja- so I, Jamie, do you know that Josh has an addiction to buying guitars? Did you know that? Yes, yes, I do know that. Josh, are you still taking banjo lessons, Josh? You don't <laughs> I, I actually, so the pandemic put an end to my banjo career. Uh, <laughs> Obviously, right, I have what's called uh, guitar acquisition syndrome. <laughs> and if I turned off my background, you'll see I, I bought a broken, what I'm doing now is I'm buying broken guitars. I bought a broken Martin guitar that had a big giant hole in the bottom. And it was two hundred dollars, and I just was like, "Well, I, the the worst that could happen is it's two hundred dollars." I threw in the garbage, but I found that you could buy little thin sheets of rosewood on Amazon. I found that you could get clamps that would hold these things together, and you could steam them and bend them on a crock pot and match the contour of the guitar. And I did all this stuff, and I ended up fixing it, and it sounds great. And if somebody, you know, I you know, I got a house full of kids and animals, and somebody picks the thing up and breaks it, so what? It was broken to begin with, so it fix it again. Um, yes. So, Josh, that literally that is the opposite of air guitar. That is actual guitar. We call well, that a I guitar. Air guitar. I can't play actual guitar very well, um, but I do want to say that these guys, the, you know, the the character, the cast of characters you present in Catching Air are phenomenally compelling. They're, they take, they grab your heart with their stories. Their enthusiasm is comes through completely. Um, you know, it must have been a real joy to watch a group. They stand for something big, as it turns out, that they feel like you can achieve a, you know, world peace through air guitar. Um, you know, certainly some of them, but it's got a positive message. It's a fun but also bizarre, you know, niche of people right you might look at them and say what like if you saw this out of context you'd be like what what's happened what's wrong with these people 
but you know there are huge groups like in anything i guess you look at all kinds of things that you think oh no one does that there's groups out there who like get together with this common interest is really really interesting so uh, let's talk a little bit about the business of documentaries my my understanding is that you lose money on on on, doc, on passion projects and documentaries so jamie you're you're driving you're you've got this idea in your head you actually make it happen i mean where is the balance between i'm going to put my own money into this versus uh, other people who are have backers and like oh i'll give you a million dollars to make a documentary about uh air guitar like Tell us a little bit, little bit about that history and and the business side. Well, I wanted to have creative control over the piece, so I knew that I didn't want anybody to um, give me money. I didn't I didn't want to be funded, and also, um, I, after I got into the piece, I knew it was going to take some time to do. So I felt that I had the resources to be able to kind of chip away and devote to this. So that wasn't a problem for, for me. At some point, my co-producer, Eric Moline suggested that we do a Kickstarter. And, you know, if you go to, if you go to Kickstarter, I mean, there's just a billion things out there. And I was like, I don't think this is going to get us really what we need. So we're just going to kind of chip away or I'm going to chip away at doing this. And um, it's, that's a hundred percent, right. You lose money doing this. I don't, I don't know that I'm ever going to recoup the the cost of the documentary. I mean, I hope so. I hope like a billion people see it. That'd be fantastic. Well, um, a billion people are going to watch this video. They're like, oh, we got to look this up. <laughs> um, but I made peace with that, you know, because when I went into this, I wanted to tell the story. And, and, I, and I decided very early on that like it wasn't going to be about me making a profit. It was going to be me telling this story that I wanted to tell, me having creative freedom, and finally, you know, getting this into a few film festivals, which I did, and I had some success at. So those were my my top three, and and financially, I never even like just don't even think about that. So Jason, you know, at as the president of Manhattan Edit Workshop, do you also do you also get into the business side, or are you only in the education and the editing side? You mean the business side of the school? No, no, no. The bit, well, yes, the business side of of making movies. In other words, students come in all the time to the workshop, and they're learning a skill. Right. But do you does the does the workshop go beyond the you're learning a skill? But you know, the, is there a warning label on every class that says, "Be careful, you might end up like Jamie Hitchings, losing money." on a documentary something. That's, that's actually our next course. It's called Be Careful You Might Be Jamie Hitchings. Right by Jamie. But <laughs> no. It, no, I mean, we don't really do that per se, except for the six-week course. Um, we do spend a lot of time talking to the students about, you know, uh, how to basically run yourself as your own business and, you know, setting yourself up for that, whether it's business cards or, you know, obviously getting your resume correct and uh, building a website, having a real um, knowing how to behave yourself in a, you know, in a, in a proper fashion, in a interview and prep yourself to, you know, be prepared to have conversations and then things like that, that aren't just about, you know, um, how, how I press this button, uh, that it's much more than that to separate you from the rest of the, of the pack. I mean, we have, we have a, um, a field trip where they go to talk to a post house and someone who hires people talks to them, which is a really good, insightful thing. Um, we don't really do balancing your checkbook or that kind of thing, but it's more, you know, I mean, it's more about handling yourself as your own business, um, because that's what you really are when you're an editor. And if you're one of the fortunate people or not fortunate, depending on what, where you want to go, that you latch on to a company, um, or a big outfit, you're going to be freelance. And, um, I know both Josh and, and Jamie can attest to that because they've done that whole, uh, route. I did it very small amount of time before I started working for Josh, but uh, I think it you, that's what that's where we instruct people is really how to run your own business as yourself, treat yourself as a business. In the words of uh, "Catch Me If You Can," uh, Josh, do you concur? I I concur, and, and we'll add that um, you know the the uh, the the idea of being an editor is also part part being social worker. 
and part being accountant and part being marketing expert. And, you know, it's not just about locking yourself in a windowless cave with a hundred hours of footage and making a story. Um, that's the best part, <laughs> which is strange because editors definitely are. I mean, I was one for many years and it's like, they're, they're, they're not necessarily meant to be the most extroverted social people, but part of the, like, I'd say the first big editing job I got was because I hit it off in a conversation with the director. The guy never even looked at my reel, but he knew I was capable enough and he knew that he we could spend time together locked in a room for six months working this out. And I think part of it is that that's that's sort of like that personality, uh, that you know, the thing that you bring to, you know, the work from a skill, like a skill set perspective, that's basic, but also um, you know, how you conduct yourself, how you support the ideas or, you know, challenge the ideas of the people you're working around. Um, those are intangibles and they can be, they certainly can be be taught to some degree, but, you know, someone who does just doesn't want to be around other people, uh, you know, it, 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 they're putting themselves at a disadvantage because that person with the same skill set, who's totally loves hanging out and, you know, uh, can, can be that for someone may, have a, you know, an edge over them. Uh, and it may be that they have it even, they're even better at the editing part of it. And yet it's harder for people to get to know that because that, that sort of PT Barnum side, that's ultimately required. If you're a freelancer, right. To go out there and just, to, you know, ring the bell for yourself. doesn't come naturally to everybody. So, yeah, but so you, what you're, well, was it, well, well, you and Jamie both wore other hats though, because you both were editors and then you became, directors and producers, which I think are even in more insane jobs, not to interrupt you, Rafi, but like, I think they're even more, you have to wear a whole other, um, hat of personality. Uh, I, I mean, I, I can only speak for myself, but I know, you know, Jamie asked, I actually shot, helped to shoot like one segment of that. I'm sure there was many other people cause you couldn't go everywhere because of your budget. I mean, how did you, how were you able to get that many people to help help you out either with money or not money uh all over the country because these people are from all over the place charisma <laughs> and, you know, the, the community's tight-knit too so i would just kind of explain what i was doing um and um hope that people would help me and and i i i didn't get a no i didn't get a no from anybody which is pretty awesome Oh, you missed the email then. Damn it. <laughs> um, you know, and, and that was that was pretty good. So I had people that donated footage, that donated, you know, obviously that I interviewed and they were there just really excited to to talk about it. But I think that's really rare that you don't get anybody that says, nah, I don't I don't want anything to do with us. You know, um, but yeah, it's it it has a lot to do with just being personable and and being excited and and meeting people you know kind of where they are and meeting people and, and what they're excited about i think josh is right like if editors or directors producers they they kind of are therapists as well i i was just going to quip before jason that uh, documentary and documentarians are people too um that there's a human side of it you can't like Josh was saying, you can't just lock yourself away in a room for six months. You actually have to get along with the other people in the room. And then if you want to take it to the next level, Jamie, you have to have that charisma. You have to have that, uh, not, not extrovertedness, but you have to have a voice, uh, and be able to ask and be human. Josh, you were, you had said in the, in the pre, in the pregame, when we were talking, something about uh music rights was there something related to i look i paid my money uh even though jason gave me a youtube screener link i still went to amazon hopefully you get some of that money because i gotta support you know independent artists who are making stuff whether it's a self-published book or a film or piece of music hats off to you and you've got my support so um i'm watching this documentary about air guitar competition and they get up on stage and air guitar to popular, known, often heavy metal songs, from my understanding, um, by the look of it, certainly. 
And that, you know, Jamie's, you know, problem, I'm sure, you know, came to, to, I don't know how quickly you tell us how quickly you figured it out was to even in a documentary, just because it's nonfiction doesn't mean you can automatically get the publishing and performance rights to a song and have it be playing in your footage. I know from a classmate of mine that had a documentary about Oliver North and at a party in the background, a Nirvana song was playing and booked like two days before their big premiere, they got a call from whatever record company saying, get that out or pay us our money. And they had to make a sound alike in the like a day, open the mix, put it in. So no one's safe from this sort of thing, even though you could argue that, you know, it's a, it's a true story. It's in the background and it's, you know, integral. But, you know, that doesn't mean that Jamie has enough money to pay lawyers to fight this off and certainly not enough for the rights. I'm assuming that it would have been in the millions of dollars. Um, but tell me a little bit about it, Jamie, because you know, interesting challenge to do a music that is so, you know, dependent on having tons of music and then having to use, you know, music that you could get that you could afford and not the music they were actually performing to. So what was that like? Yeah. So, um, I foolishly went into this thinking, oh, we'll figure out music rights later on. We'll, we'll figure it out. I don't know what we're going to do. We'll figure it out. And um, I was working with, I had an assistant editor. Her name is Roselle. And um, I was like, Roselle, just for, just for fun, can you do a little research for me? Let's figure out how much this is going to cost. Because I knew that music rights were going to be a lot of money. And I thought, well, maybe I could selectively, you know, license two or three, you know, selective works or, or see what I had uh, the finances for. So at the beginning of the the film, we have a character called the Lost Heartbreaker, and he's air guitaring to American Girl by Tom Petty. And I was like, Rizal, uh, please, please figure out the um, what that would cost. And she went away and, and, and kept me uh, updated on it. And she had to figure out the person, the, the, the group that owned the catalog is different than the group that owned the actual rights. I might be misspeaking about this, but there was levels of um, rights we needed to clear. And she was kind of, um, you know, going around in circles and trying to figure this out. She finally came back with the quote, and I believe just American Girl was going to be over $10,000 for... 30 seconds of what I needed. Um, and the reason that I might be misquoting the number is because I think I passed out when she told me said number. Um, <laughs> so it was just, it was just ridiculous. And then I said, well, okay, Judas Priest, uh, can you go check this out? And, and it was like basically the same result. So I was realizing, A, um, I never wanted to be a music supervisor. I never wanted to deal with this. B, like Rosella had much more patience than I did. And C, we had zero dollars. We had zero dollars for, for music. Um, so we had to start getting really, really creative. And we actually had um, a sound designer who did do some, some tracks for us. But the other place that this music came from is it came from Eric Moline, my co-producer, and his bands. Um, so he had a had a couple bands that we were able to get the, the the rights to, and that really helped out a lot. But there was no way I don't it, I don't even know I can't even speculate how much licensing all that music would have been, because we just gave up after I almost had you know a heart attack. Um, but it would have been probably quadruple the amount of money I spent on the rest of the film. Um, so the part in the movie that you're talking about, it's it's Bohemian Rhapsody. And Rizal was like, do you want me to fi figure out how much it would be to license? But I was like, no, we don't need to go through this again. We can't afford it. Um, so we had to come up with like, how you know it's Bohemian Rhapsody, but we're not licensing Bohemian Rhapsody. And like, that's the only thing we could think of, you know? I think the only thing that would have made that particular scene better is if we had crickets in it. <laughs> but, you know, you know, because there's this stupid text that comes on and, and you know um, what song they're all air guitaring to. So we kind of call attention to the fact that we don't have money to do this. And this is a music documentary that's not using 
any of the music that it should. So it's kind of absurd, but it fits with the absurdness of the subject matter. I All I can picture is the backseat of Wayne's World, uh, uh, of the car of them, uh, you know, <laughs> head, head bopping. And we remember the song from the movie Wayne's World? <laughs> then people can figure it out. So we're uh, we're just about out of time, but I just wanted to get some closing comments um, and some takeaways. If you wanted to just put, a, put across one, one thing about film editing, the industry, the business, uh, documentaries, Jamie, what, what would it be? What, what are you saying to the new documentarians uh, and the uh, industry people out there that want to? It, Providing that Josh stays away from the <laughs> what he said before, what would you uh, what would you like for your takeaway to be? Um, I think that you know you just have to be able to tell the story that you want to tell. You know, within reason. If you're working with a group, it's tell the story, tell the story of the of the group or the producer, or whatever else. But you have to be true to the story, and you have to be true to the characters. Like I, I feel like my representation of the characters in the film was um, was was very open and honest i didn't manipulate things i just wanted them to be who they were i wanted i wanted to have at the end of the day i wanted to have a piece of work that um i not only was proud of but they were proud to to be in and represent um it's hard you're gonna put in a lot of a lot of hours um and it's definitely it's definitely a marathon you know it is not it is not a 400 meter dash it is a marathon and you just live with this thing and this thing like I, I always felt that that catching air was right here on my shoulder you know and it was always just right here so even if I was doing other things I was always kind of part of me was just always kind of thinking of things that that I needed to do or I wanted to try or whatever else but it definitely definitely lives with you and you have to be comfortable with you know your work living with you and 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 being with you for a long time all right, Josh, Jason, final thoughts, closing comments? Uh, I'll just say, I, I think that in our experience of people that have come to the school and gone on and worked, or people like Jamie, or even Josh, who's done his fair share of documentaries, um, I think it could be the most rewarding thing that you do with your career, and probably also the, the, the and on a flip side of it, one of the hardest things you could do. Maybe that is why it's so rewarding. Um, I mean, we've had people come and uh, rent our facilities to host documentaries, and we've seen them on a daily basis coming out. We've heard screaming matches. We've heard people get fired. We've heard, I mean, we've been exposed to it all. And, you know, and we're just trying to run a school here and encourage people to get into these careers. And there's people screaming at each other over some cut or they couldn't get rights to a footage or, oh, I don't know, somebody in, I don't know, some country couldn't get on the phone or plane, I, you know, on and on and on. So um, I think if you're going to get into this, that type of area of editing or shooting or any of that stuff, you, be prepared that you're going all in if you want to get success out of it. And it's going to be bumpy, but ultimately, if you stick with it, it'll be rewarding. I think that's probably, as Jamie can attest to. Josh, thoughts? Um, well, I, you know, I think when you're doing... Um, there's rock climbing and bouldering. And in bouldering, I believe when you approach something, it's called a problem, a bouldering problem. That's the terminology. And you try to climb this thing and solve that. And you know, when you get to the end of it, you it's that's and it's the one of the more like it's for fun. No one does it, you know, if they're not doing it for fun or for, you know, uh exercise. And I think that when I say that documentary editors and editors in general, and, and maybe, you know, anyone in this sort of creative field are, are problem solvers, whether it's, I can't get rights to the music. I need to make this. We have to figure out how to make the best film we can make under the, so these set of circumstances. That's, that's problem solving, right? Um, you know, trying to figure out how to get this person on the phone for an interview because it kills the movie and screaming and yelling is another way of problem solving. Um, but we're, you know, that's what I think where the gratifying part comes in and the frustrating part comes in and, you know, you, you know, you're in it when it's just like, that's how you approach life is that, you know, not in a bad way. We're here to provide a solution to a problem, whatever that is. 
Um, some are better, some are worse. There's not, it's not a mathematical equation, right? There are 500 ways that you could have solved that problem, Jamie, in the film. Um, there are 500 ways you can get up that bouldering problem. Um, finding one that feels right, that fits the amount of time and budget you have is also a factor, but you know, a different person is going to come up with a different solution. That's what makes this such an interesting industry is that it's full of creative people with a, in a varied sense of ideas and how to approach these, uh, these sort of problems. So, um, never, never a dull moment. So, uh, ju just in closing, um, top one, two, three documentaries and your thoughts about mockumentaries. Quick, quick round here to, to, to close it off. Uh, Jamie, top, top documentaries and do you, the mockumentaries, thumbs up, thumbs down. Well, besides catching air, of course, um, my all time, I'll just, I'll keep it short. My all time favorite documentary is Pumping, Pumping the Iron. And we used to actually show that in the, in the six week. And I absolutely adore that film. And it's not just because of the characters. I know a lot about it. I, uh, I got to talk to the editor. It's just a fantastic piece of filmmaking. And, um, that's got to be my top. Probably okay. I'll give you one more. My octopus teacher. That's a, another pandemic one. I cried like a baby when I saw it, but it was it was fantastic. Mockumentaries. I love them. I would love to do a mockumentary one day. Um, you know, you got you got the king of the mountain. This is Spinal Tap. But you know, I'd, I'd have to say Best in Show is also very very good. It's, I think I might like that a little bit more than this is Spinal Tap. But I'll, I'll hand it over to the guys. All right, Jason. Uh, my favorite dog winner is Thin Blue Line. I don't know if you guys are familiar. Yeah, I know who those two are. But uh, I think that kind of changed documentaries um, their, uh, to how they are now. Um, I think that, you know, uh, that that movie, uh, I remember seeing it for the first time and I, I, I was like, oh, this is something that could actually change how things actually, you know, the outcome of a real story in real life. And I think that that's, you know, that changing uh, affecting something in a real life gives it another level. Um, I love mockumentaries. My favorite is uh, American Vandal. Have you ever seen that? Nobody's seen American Vandal. No, no, I guess I got to see American Vandal. It won't be the same, but I, I got to check it out. <laughs> right, Josh. Um, well, I could go on, but um, the ones that popped into my head immediately were, well, Marjo which uh, is, a, is a really bizarre documentary about a former evangelical uh, pastor who was eight or nine when he became famous and then went back as a young adult to sort of bring a, hide a camera crew and bring them in to show the re like what really goes on. Um, but my favorite, fa like I think High Fidelity, not the bad one. I'm not talking about The Adventures of the Gunnery String Quartet, which is a verite documentary about one of the most celebrated string quartets in the world at the time. And, uh, you know, to watch it, you'd think it was shot like a narrative feature film with coverage and, and scripted moments. And, to, you know, I, I never, I can never look at it without marveling at how you would take a single camera, 16 millimeter shoot and cover something that could then be turned into something that feels like you were shooting it with just, you know, as much video as you could shoot with as many cameras as you could shoot and then put it together. This was a real, like, you know, old school film shot on film with one person. And it's, it's just, it's unbelievable when you watch it, the effect it has on you in terms of bringing out emotional moments and feeling like it's just like really laid out beforehand. Um, and then I'll go with a mighty wind because, uh, I also am a Christopher guest fan and there's a sweetness to that, that I think, um, has been un unmet in his other movies before or since there's something very powerful about um their duet at the end that always gets me but they're great i mean they're fun not not enough of them are great but i think the idea of them is terrific so i, I had mentioned last waltz before that's um uh, uh, of my best maybe just because i saw it in my in my teen years when i was just getting into music more recently last year uh fantastic fungi uh, about mushrooms, um, I incredible, something that I never even thought about before, but a friend of mine who was going through cancer treatments, he said, you got it. You, everyone, everyone in the world has to watch this. I just the incredible edible and not edible mushroom. Uh, and my mockumentary 
hands down best in the show, but I'm sure there are a couple of others. Um, thank you, Jamie, for joining us uh, and being, I, I can say this, the greatest guest we've had on the show this month. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> Don't shoot any more episodes this month. That's it. You're good. <laughs> right. Exactly. So uh, I'm Rafi Salem with the Manhattan Edit Workshop. Thank you, Jason. Thank you. Thank you, Josh Apter. And thank you, Jamie Hitchings, for joining us. Uh, tune in next time on our YouTube channel, our Vimeo channel, our websites. We've got a lot going on. SightSoundAndStory.com, FilmmakerU.com, MuShop.com. Jamie, uh, how can people find you and reach you? They can um, find me on Instagram, Catching Air Documentary, Catching Air Doc on Instagram. Um, yeah, that'd probably be the easiest place to to find me. All right, Josh, Jason, final, final, final. Go buy that movie on Amazon. Rent it or buy it. She would do it for you. What? She would. She would do it. She would do it. All right, everyone. Uh, happy holidays. Uh, Thanksgiving is coming up. So uh, enjoy, be safe, and uh, just enjoy. Everybody smile on the way out. <laughs> <laughs>